Wonderful. All right, we are team Let's Ride, and this is our presentation for our Dev10 capstone project. Hey, my name is Josh Kessler. I graduated last year with a bachelor's degree in computer science. Uh, my interests in that field mainly include object oriented programming, uh, computer architecture, cryptography, and discrete math. Hello, my name is Isaiah Rodriguez. I graduated also last year from Sam Houston State University uh, with my bachelor's in computing science. Um, I first heard about Dev10 through uh, some online articles talking about their uh, training program and the instructing staff. And I found it be a great experience to apply for. And my name is Kyle Green. Uh, I graduated from Ripon College with a double major in economics and business management. And for the past few years, I've been working in the real estate sector and Dev10 is my entryway into the tech field. I've enjoyed the rich detail that we've gotten from all of our instructors and I look forward to moving on and beginning my career as a developer. So let's get a brief overview of what our application is. Our application is something that is a web-based platform to connect and inform cyclists. So you've seen many of these different kinds of apps out there. Strava is one that comes to mind. We also had a team present earlier in the day here. They did a similar project. So it is an application where say, I'm a cyclist, I'm new to an area and I'm looking to find clubs or teams or rides and I wanna go and meet other people who have similar interests. I can go on this application and I can search through a database to find those clubs and rides. It also provides a functional information hub for the people who are administrators or in charge of those clubs and rides. It allows them to manage the club members and the ride attendees as they come and go. Um, in terms of the technologies that we use to build this application, it is a React-based front end with uh, material UI used for the design elements in the front. They have a very strong architecture of pre-built components that allow you to do some pretty creative and functional elements. In terms of global state management, we were able to implement Redux and Sagas, which in itself was a challenge, but it's definitely rewarding when you are able to access um, things in a global state from various different components. We also incorporated Google Maps and Google Map Ge Geocode APIs. So when we were um, working with addresses, we would use a geocoder to turn them into coordinates and then store them in our database. And then when we were retrieving those coordinates back from the database, we could convert them back again from coordinates to an address. And that's very powerful because it also allows us the opportunity to use coordinates to implement a kind of route or ride system in the future, similar to other applications that you may know about where you can plan a route, go and you know it kind of tells you where to go. This opens the door to a lot of different implementations. For the front end, we also used um, several packages from um, NPM that allow us to have just general quality of life improvements and to make a better, more functional application. So now I'll turn it over to Josh and he'll give you some information on the back end and then start to walk you through the rest of our application. Yeah, so I primarily worked on the back end of the application and we used uh, Spring Data JPA and Spring Data REST was built on top of that. Uh, Spring Data JPA or JPA is the Java specification for persistence, which in the simplest terms is when a Java object in this case needs to outlive the process that created it originally. Um, Spring Data REST, our, our Java objects are annotated with entity and they're considered or they're mapped using the default ORM, Object Relational Management um, tool, Hibernate. They are mapped to relations in the database. So they match up pretty much perfectly with um, the fields and the classes and the attributes on the, uh, the relations. Um, Spring Boot was used to um, We'll do what Spring Boot does, boot us up, uh, Tomcat server. Um, Spring Security also, we use JWT, and I'll explain more about that. So we'll move to the schema slide next, and just your average MySQL database, whatever your database. Okay, so this is the schema, and it looks really simple, and that's probably because it is, but 
there is some design decisions I'd like to point out here. The first of which is the writer relation containing the username and password. So instead of creating another table for the user, we, or I just, yeah, we, um, because the way Spring Security works, you can have, there doesn't have to be a designated user class. There just has to be a class that implements the user details interface, which Rider does. So we can kind of kill two birds with one stone there um, with the writer's information and their username and password stored in one table. Um, the role relation, it represents not only members, but their authorities within clubs themselves. And we can demonstrate more of that on the um, application itself. But yes. Oh, this is it. Hi, bye, guys. Okay, so the home page. This is the home page to our application. Let's ride. Uh, when you're on the home page and you're not signed in, you're greeted with a map demonstrating the clubs nearest to your area. And Kyle, you're in Minnesota, so that's why it says Minneapolis. Um, on the right is just the list of the clubs themselves um, that are shown on the map. And if we scroll down, we should see a calendar with rides coming up uh, nearest to us and their times. Really convenient if you just want to sign up for a ride really quick and don't want to go through the process of searching and do the form. But we do want to do that for demonstration purposes. So let's sign up for an account. Yes. Your basic form, first name, last name, username, and the username has to be unique in the database. And the password is also um, stored encrypted, so no plain text there. And uh, it has to be strong enough for the capital letter, special character, number, and eight characters long. But we do not want to receive emails, let's sign up. And then we're redirected directly to the login page. So we'll log in with the credentials we just made, and bam, okay. So now it doesn't look like much has changed, but if you click on the little L in the top right corner, you'll see that the options are different now because it doesn't sign up. But we'll have, the options are different now because um, we now have the role user authority uh, stored because of the JWT token. Um, let's go to clubs. Let's look for a clubs in our area. So when you hit clubs, you're redirected to the club search form. So the postal code is all that required because the way GA code works, you can enter a full address or just a postal code, and it's really good at determining what you meant and analyzing what the address is that you entered. So we'll just enter a postal code, search, and these are the clubs nearest to 55430. And they're all within a uh, 30 kilometer radius, I think, that's how we set it up. But let's check out Brooklyn Park site. These are the details of the club detail page, the details for Brooklyn Park Cycling Club. Uh, you're met with a description, which is right now just some full cool medicine text, but would be more descriptive. Uh, and the location spread out over city, state, and street. Um, usually, if you had administrative privileges to the club, which right now we don't, since we're a new user, you would see an admin button to do administrative functions. So as of right now, we don't have that. And we are going to log in. Well, first, let's create a new club. Let's go back on the back button. Oh yeah, I just search, that's fine. And new club. I think I will take over yeah, here. Yeah, go ahead, bud. Um, so here if, where is where we can create a new club. Uh, if you hit the create button right now with uh, nothing entered, we get the validation for the requirements to be entered in the fields. Now we'll enter the, uh, into the club name. Uh, and then we'll put the required postal code and optional membership fee. And there we go. It sends us to the newly created club so that we can view it. And because we created the club, we're automatically assigned the admin role for the club so that we can manage it. And through the admin role, we can manage the incoming request for memberships and ride creation. So riders can apply to become a member of this club and those members can try and create rides for people to attend. Uh, currently we have none for this club because it's a newly created club with no members or new applications. But uh, we'll display, we'll, we'll uh, show this by going to a pre created admin account. Oh, 
log in. Excuse me, I have the wrong password. And there we go. We're into this other account that we created beforehand. Uh, now we just need to find the club that we created. And if you see here, this now displays the club that we had created with the previous account, the My Club. This is a great club. And now we'll go into the Brooklyn Park Cycling Club. View the details. We have the admin role for this one because it was created by this account. And here we go. We have some uh, rides that we can accept or decline uh, approval for. So we will start by approving the Serena Heights or the Bloomington. Okay, we'll approve the Bloomington. And there you go, it's been approved, the ride has been created, and now we'll decline the Serena Heights, and it has been declined and removed. Now when we go to rides, we can search for the rides as well by their postal code. And here we have it. We have the ride that we created, the special tribute warning ride. And we can also view the details of that ride. We have the description, the address, city, state, date. There's a rider limit that's optional in case they decide they want to limit how many people they want attending. And then there we have the club sponsoring, the club that this was created under. And from the visit button, we can now view the uh, uh, club information. Wonderful. Thank you, Isaiah. So that will complete the end of our demonstration here. Uh, we really wanted to say thank you to Corbin, Dylan, and the entire Dev10 instructor team. It's been a pretty arduous process getting through these 14 weeks, but we've learned a lot and you all have been invaluable. So on that note, we're open to any questions that anyone might have. Congratulations, you guys. Really well done. I know you put a lot of effort into this and it, it's evident in the final product. So congrats. So my question for you guys to start out is um, looking back two and a half weeks ago, um, how much of what you um, planned to achieve did you get done here? And how did you manage that, that scope creep or, or scope management? Okay. Um, that would probably be the one thing we do differently. We had a very, very ambitious project end goal, like what we had in mind. And it was pretty similar. I think we all imagined the same thing. But at the, you know, we didn't lose the game. We just ran out of time. That's all I can say. Um, we wanted to implement some Strava API stuff and routes and a lot of things. And I think that if we could go back, we, should, we would take less of a, like a cowboy code approach and more of a like waterfall methodology type, like systematic uh, development scheme. But yeah. Yeah, I'd add on to that. I'd say, as, as Josh said, we had some pretty lofty goals. And in some sense, we accomplished some pretty amazing things. While the user interface is functional, um, if simple, behind the scenes, there's a lot of pretty advanced technology that's been going on. Josh did an amazing job, as well as Isaiah, with building out a very secure and functional program. So I think our biggest goals would probably have been to reach towards something that would have a little bit more flash and pizzazz for the user. Um, you know, there's always the ability to polish and make something look a little bit more professional. But I think the, yeah, that, that our main goal would be some more flashy features, including integration of maybe, um, a routes page that would have been very cool but we have as i said earlier we have the opportunity to do that seeing as we're already using uh google maps apis um we're connected to that system and so that would be just kind of the next step in the development well behind uh, that user interface i know is a lot of really complex work and corbin asks he would love to know more about the spring data rest and redux saga I can speak a little bit more about Spring Data Rest. Um, so Spring Data Rest is part of the Spring Project, the Spring Data Project. Uh, it builds on top of JPA and exposes JPA repositories um, as HTTP methods, not methods, but that's the word I'm going to use. Um, 
the intuition behind using it was that this was only required a very simple CRUD type of backend. It didn't require um, very complex queries. And so Spring Data JPA or the JPA repository um, provides you with a list, or not a list, a set of um, built in methods like find by ID, find all, uh, save, delete, and update. And uh, these are exposed automatically as REST, re or REST resources, uh, depending on uh, the extension on the HTTP URI. So also, um, I have one thing I want to say about data REST, but it, it skipped my mind. Uh, sorry, Corbin. Next slide. Um, in terms of Redux, uh, I can have a good pun for you here, but implementing that was a bit of a saga in of itself. So originally we started off doing state management just in kind of a typical React way using local states and then refactoring to include sagas and Redux so we could use a global state was a bit of a bear. So in terms of thinking about things that we could have changed when we were at the start of the application, approaching that from the ground up um, with that methodology would have definitely been an improvement and I think saved us a few gray hairs. But uh, yeah, we were able to uh, get it working and there's always opportunities to improve and to have the application be more streamlined. Awesome. So I'm curious and we'll start with Isaiah. What was your favorite part of this project? Oh man, my favorite part was, how do you say it? I guess finally getting the back end connected with the front end part, especially in those API calls working and being able to just send back, pull out all of the info that we wanted to display it for the rides and the clubs. I would say that. My favorite, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Josh. Oh, I thought we were like going over or something. But yeah, my favorite part, if I um, had to say, was learning more about the spring data project, specifically JPA and persistence. Because originally when I was using it, it was just a series of annotations, but I really got curious about how, what was going on like underneath. And I got in this deep dive, like this rabbit hole of just like Wikipedia article, the next Wikipedia article, and this to that. And uh, I learned a lot. And my favorite part was definitely, oh, yes. Uh, my favorite part of the project was learning through my teammate. So there was a lot that Josh and Isaiah both did to kind of push new technologies that I wasn't familiar with. And they were um, super friendly and helpful when it came to kind of explaining how their implementations were working and what the technology behind them were. So, you know, always learning something new and just uh, continuing to expand my technological vocabulary, so to say. Awesome. Well, I think what's, what's cool about what you guys just said is that it's problem solving and learning. And that's that's the, the life ahead of you, right, as a developer. So uh, it's fun that you found that as the most enjoyable part of this exercise, right? And that's, that's the intent, right? That you get to challenge yourself, learn and build those skills. So congratulations, you guys. You did a fantastic job. Um, big round of applause for everything that you achieved. It's just amazing you know, to see how far every team comes and, and the really unique approaches you take on this. So. Well done, congratulations.